You may know that I picked my college, McAllister College, because I didn't have to take math as a requirement to graduate. Yeah, I know, it's really sad, isn't it? <laughs> For those who are really good at numbers, you may be really upset and distressed by that. But for the rest of you, please have mercy on me. <laughs> uh, as a sign of my inability to do numbers well, the sermon title is wrong. It should say, forgive 77 times or 490 times, which is what Luke and Matthew talk about, seven times 70, not seven times 77. So anyway, whatever works best for you, let's, let's go there. I want to also share a reading that is a part of the lectionary texts, uh, but we did not read this morning, and it comes from Sirach. Uh, in the Apocrypha, uh, you will find these texts. In other traditions this morning, this will be read in church. So let me share this reading from the book of Sirach. Sirach is a book of wisdom uh, that comes from the Hebrew ethical teachings, and it was written around 200 BCE by a Jewish scribe named Ben Sirah of Jerusalem. So listen for this reading that comes from Sirach 2730 through 287. Anger and wrath, these are also abominations, and the sinful man will possess them. He that takes vengeance will suffer vengeance from the Lord, and he will firmly establish his sins. Forgive your neighbor the wrong he has done, and then your sins will be pardoned when you pray. Does a man harbor anger against another and yet seek for healing from the Lord? Does he have no mercy toward a man like himself and yet pray for his own sins? If he himself being flesh maintains wrath, who will make expiation for his sins? Remember, the end of your life, and cease from all these troubles. Remember destruction and death, and be true to the commandments. Remember the commandments, and do not be angry with your neighbor. Remember the covenant with the Most High, and overlook ignorance. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. A wise Catholic sister named Sister Margaret once said, be careful about over-tending your wounds. Some people go through life pressing a bruise so that neither they nor they hope the world will ever forget it and they will always see the bruise. It's quite an image to have, really. I can see myself at times focusing on a purple mark on my arm, remembering exactly who had bumped up against me and my schemes and thrown my perfect plan off track. Has this ever happened to you? Have you done something similar to this, nursed a wound that you can see and feel and touch? Sister Margaret's advice was a gentler version of Sirach's opening observation. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner holds them tight. What motivates us to cherish wrath and anger? Sirach doesn't say, but he suggests that a remedy for it is to remember our last days and set enmity aside. Another rabbi wrote years later, begin each day forgiving those toward whom you feel wrath and anger, as if it was your last day. When he told this to his students, the students turned to their rabbi and said, why? Why would we treat this day as if it were our last day? And their teacher answered, we need to live each day as if it were our last day, because it may be. So lay it aside to begin each day. Maybe that's where Jesus was going with his 77 and 490, where the wisdom of Sirach gives us clear maxim. Jesus tells us a story to confound us from multiple angles. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you do this a lot. 
When Jesus talks about a king and two servants, the story sounds pretty straightforward. One person forgave, another didn't, so the stingy guy loses out in the end. Anyone from about five years old can get this, right? But it is a lot deeper, so let's dig a little deeper. First of all, we have the king. Playing the role of God in this production, the king, of course, is omnipotent. He can buy and sell both people and things at will. He calls on one of his slaves. That's the literal translation comes out to, to settle accounts, to settle accounts. Now the slave is in big trouble. He owes the king something on the order of 6,000 to 10,000 working days and working days wages. That's about 20 years of work or well over a million dollars in today's terms. Nobody but another king could come through with such a repayment. When the slave begs, the king spares him and his family from being killed and banished from obs into obscurity. So what did the king accomplish in this? He demonstrates and acts with full extent of his power and authority. He has the power to erase debt, even greater than being able to collect on it in some ways. As we know from the reaction of the servants, the public saw what he did. What the slaves perceived was obvious. They saw the king change his whole heart, his whole way. But what about the guy for whom the king changed? We might say that he pleaded with the king and got, got what he asked for, right? Did he think he had pulled one over on the king? That his act was so good that the king fell for it? Did he feel ashamed that he had stooped to begging? Did he feel like he had gotten let go? He had, he had gotten let, let off? Did he just think the king was stupid? All those attitudes are possible all at the same time. Even if the slave had conned the king, the entire situation made the vast difference of their power immensely and painfully obvious. As slave, whether debtor or released, he would always see himself as beholden to the king, as would others. In the very next act, the tables turn. The absolved debtor has the upper hand over someone else who owes him. And what does he do? Having learned nothing about real power, he exposes the tininess of his mind and heart by sending this fellow to debtor's prison until the debt is paid. Again, a highly unlikely outcome. When other people see how the tables are turned, they go and tell the king. In the end, the original debtor ends up in a torturous condition that he brought upon himself. When we go beneath the surface of this story, we see that even after being relieved of his debt, the first slave chose to live in a world of oppression and domination. Although the king's forgiveness had created an alternative to strict economic justice or tit-for-tat relationships, the slave rejected that option. Given the opportunity to increase the bounty, the bounty in this world, he instead supported a caste system that offered him petty superiority. By reinforcing a strictly transactional system and the power of dominion, he ultimately became his own torturer. As Sirach warned, he held tight to terrible things and he created more terrible things. There would always be someone over him and there would always be someone that he could torment. Sirach talked about the cherishing of wrath. That seems to be the direct route to self-inflicted torment, the cherishing of wrath. Is there another way to go? How about the alternative to cherishing wrath? Cherishing gratitude. Instead of pressing the bruise continuously, we could rejoice and marvel at our body's remarkable powers of regeneration and healing. Before we call in any debts, we might take account of what has been given to us, beginning with life itself and then all the unmerited advantages in our time and place in history we have received through generosity. I can think of at least 
490 reasons to forgive. And then when I started writing them down, I thought, no, no one's going to stay for a 490-point sermon. Am I right? Good. Okay, I just want to make sure, because I've got them in my hip pocket if you want me to pull all 490 out. I can think of those reasons, but I want to be practical today. I want you to think about forgiveness in your own self-interest. I want you to think about forgiveness in your own self-interest. Forgiveness helps you heal. In a study on unforgiveness, John Hopkins Medicine revealed that there are significant impacts on the body, both physically and mentally, when a person refuses to forgive. According to the study, unresolved conflicts can lead to chronic anger, which puts the body into a fight or flight mode, resulting in changes of heart, changes of heart rate and blood pressure and immune responses. And these changes increase the risk of depression and heart disease and diabetes, just to name a few conditions. Research has also shown that unforgiveness is connected to the weakening of the immune system, reducing of sleep, chronic pain, and cardiovascular problems. Because unforgiveness hinders the body's ability to heal, forgiveness exercises the opposite. It exercises the, ab the body's ability to take the world on in a new way. There are now whole trainings on forgiveness for cancer patients because they have found through the study and through the research at John Hopkins and other places that cancer holds on to us, right? But if we let go of the things that we're holding on to, we change. Very powerful. It's important to note that forgiveness can have huge health benefits. So this is where the self-interest comes in. The act of forgiveness lowers the risk of heart attack, improves cholesterol, increases sleep, reduces pain, blood pressure, and levels of anxiety, depression, and stress change. So if you're struggling with forgiveness, it's important to remember that it's in an active process that you're in courts a decision to hurt you. It's actually hurting you personally and physically and spiritually. And that's where Jesus is teaching on forgiving 77 times or 490 times comes in. I like the choice. Jesus gives us a choice. You can do it 77 times or you can do it 490. Most of us would choose, of course, 490 because we want to forgive more <laughs> rather than less. Dr. Karen Schwartz from John Hopkins writes that we have to make forgiveness a part of our daily lives on a daily basis, working on forgiveness over and over again. She says, forgiveness is a choice. You are choosing to offer compassion and empathy to a person who has wronged you. The following steps can help you develop a more forgiving attitude and benefit from better emotional and physical health. She offers these. First, reflect and remember. That includes the events themselves and how you reacted, how you felt, and how the anger and hurt has affected you since. Second, empathize with the other person. For instance, if your spouse grew up in an alcoholic family, then anger when you have too many glasses of wine might be more understandable, right? Third, forgive deeply. Simply forgiving someone because you think you have no other alternative or because you think your religion requires it, read Christianity, it may not be enough to get you to healing. One study found that people whose forgiveness came in part from understanding that no one is perfect were able to resume normal relationships with the other person, even if the other person never apologized. Those who only forgave in an effort to salvage the relationship wound up in a worse relationship. Very important to remember that. Fourth, let go of expectations. An apology may not change your relationship with the other person or elicit an apology from her or him. If you don't expect either, you won't be disappointed. Fifth, decide to forgive. Once you make that choice, seal it with an action. If you don't feel you can talk to the person who wronged you, write it down. Write down your forgiveness in a journal or even talk 
about it with someone else in your life whom you trust. Sixth, forgive yourself. And this one is the big one. The act of forgiving includes forgiving yourself. For instance, if your spouse had an affair, recognize that the affair is not a reflection of your self-worth. Literally, at the heart of all that is essential in the work of forgiveness, forgiving oneself is there at the core of it. Forgiving oneself can be a challenging, challenging process, but it is essential for mental health and well-being. And here are five steps. See, I have five more things and I'm done. I'll sit down. Understand your emotions. Becoming aware of the emotions you're experiencing is an important part about learning how to forgive yourself. Research has found that identifying and labeling your emotion can help you reduce the intensity of your feeling. Second, accept responsibility for what happened. Forgiving yourself is more than just putting the past behind you and moving on. It is about accepting what has happened and showing compassion to yourself, facing what you have done or what has happened in the first step towards self-forgiveness. Third, treat yourself with kindness and compassion. Forgiving yourself requires confronting your actions and showing remorse for what happened, but it is important to approach this with self-compassion. Fourth, express remorse for your mistakes. Expressing remorse for your mistakes can help you move forward and let go of negative feelings. And finally, make amends and apologize, including apologizing to yourself. Making amends and apologizing can help you take responsibility for your actions and show that you're moving on. You and I don't need to keep pressing the bruises anymore. And we certainly don't need to end up in prison, a prison of our own creating. In fact, according to Matthew 18, 21 to 35, it is by not forgiving that we always end up in a place like that. No matter how you get there, let's all step into this, forgiving 77 times or 490 times if you prefer. 77 days or 490 days. 77 months or 490 months. 77 years or 490 years. I don't think any of us will make that last number. <laughs> Whatever works best for you but make the choice and start today to forgive others and forgive yourself. It will be good for you, for your health, your happiness, and good for those whom you love and those around you.